Good morning, good afternoon, and welcome to Five Ways to Increase Engagement and Revenue with CRM Data. Today, we'll explore the CRM data that's most useful to your email program, how to use this data to drive acquisition and segmentation, and how, to use, and how our featured speaker, CNET, uses their data to improve email engagement, retention, and drive real revenue. Before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Please submit your questions using the Q&A chat feature throughout the webinar, and we'll answer them during the Q&A session toward the end. We'll also be sending you the webinar recording and slides after the webinar is over. To start, a bit about our speaker. Dave Hendricks is president of Live Intent, where he devises corporate strategies and tries to simplify marketing language. Before Live Intent, Dave was the Executive Vice President of Operations at Pulse Point, where he ran their ESP Storm Post, which is now known as Post Up. He was a member of the founding executive team at Experian Cheetah Mail and began his email adventure at pioneering ESP Message Media. Dave was named one of Business Insider's Top 100 Technologists in 2011, and Ally Watch named him one of the 15 people changing advertising in 2014. Diana Primo is the Director of Member Services Audience Development at CNET, the number one source for researching tech and consumer electronics, and the world's largest and most trusted tech media source for news, reviews, and downloads, with more than 100 million unique users. Diana leads a cross-functional team that drives site engagement, increases subscription conversions, maximizes social and traditional email registration, and manages the email lists of millions of unique visitors. Brian Banks is an account director at Blue Hornet and brings eight years of digital marketing experience to help a select group of the ESP's more than 2,200 customers, Xerox, KFC, Columbia Sportswear, Zazzle.com, and of course, CNET among them, to grow and optimize their email programs by more than 20% year over year. And now we'll dig in. Brian? Thanks, Kim. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm an account director here at Blue Hornet. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with us, um, Blue Hornet is an email service provider that helps our clients leverage their CRM data to power personalized email messages for their subscribers. Um, our customer success team works with small to medium-sized businesses as well as enterprise companies to drive revenue and push their email programs to the next level. Um, you know, we have the pleasure of working with a lot of great partners to maximize returns for our clients, and included in this list of partners is Live Intent. Uh, Dave, uh, can you tell our attendees a little about Live Intent? Yeah, absolutely, Brian. Um, uh, thanks for joining me on the webinar. It's really great to talk to you again. Uh, also, Diana, uh, great to talk to you. Live Intent and Blue Hornet are longtime partners. Blue Hornet is a live certified uh, partner of Live Intent. And what they do with us is they uh, put our tags, the Live Intent Live tag, into their partner's email templates. And doing so, what they do is produce uh, new revenue opportunities and new customer reach opportunities within email. It's real-time email ad technology, and it's, uh, it's something that we pioneered in 2010, and we're really excited to work with Blue Hornet and our fantastic partners like CVSI. So let's get right to it. Let's go through CRM, a crash course in how to use CRM data. What is CRM data? That's a good question, right? Um, when, you, when you talk to someone who's in this business and, and you say, well, what does CRM data mean to you? It can mean so very many things. Uh, it could mean uh, what they've purchased. It could mean where they live, their phone number, uh, the interaction history, so many different things. And so depending on who you're talking to, it can mean a lot of different stuff. Um, in this webinar, we're going to talk about five ways that you can use this CRM data to increase engagement and revenue for your business. And uh, this will be done using uh, practical examples, uh, both of Blue Hornet, uh, CBSI and CNET, and Live Intent. Brian? Thanks, Dave. So, um, 
As email marketers, we love data. You know, whether it's explicit data, um, you know, the information your customers have provided on sign-up forms, during the checkout process, etc., cetera, um, or implicit data, the information we can glean through their click, browse, and search behavior. So, like uh, any good CRM, the goal is to build a more complete picture of your customer across multiple channels and understand how they've integrated your brand into their daily life. Um, so, on the email side, some of the cross-channel questions we ask are, you know, how active um, are, is your subscriber on your social networks? Um, how do they engage with your site? How often? Uh, how deep they're clicking in? How long they're spending on certain pages? Um, you know, as far as like loyalty programs, are they even members of the loyalty programs? And, you know, how many points do they have uh, assigned to their profile? You know, are they purchasers? Uh, and if so, what kind of purchaser are they? Are they high value, low value? Are they a frequent shopper uh, or others? So, you know, also, you know, kind of based on, you know, what they purchase, what kind of stuff are they into? So seeking the answers to these questions not only helps us understand the value of our customers, but also drives the way we engage with them via our segmentation and, and personalized experience. And that, you know, kind of drives that message content and frequency, you know, that we'll be serving up for them. So, um, you know, how can we tie all this uh, data to a specific subscriber? Mr. Hendricks? Well, of course, the most important way to tie all this data to a subscriber is via the email address. Um, why is the email address the most important data point in a CRM system? Well, I, I think it's pretty simple. Uh, persistence. The, the email address is something that you have for a very, very long time. Take a look at your own uh, experience, your own behavior. You've got a couple, two, three email addresses that you use. You've got one for business, your Blue Hornet address, and then you've got that Gmail or Yahoo, or if you're really old school, you've got an AOL address. The key to this address is that in order to unlock the Internet, you have to have an email address. Try doing anything using Netflix, buying something on Amazon, logging into Twitter, or even buying and setting up an iPhone or a tablet. You can't do it without an email address. It's just that important. And so, in my opinion, the email address is the most important element. It's the primary key of the Internet and the most important element of your CRM system. Cool. So, um, you know, now that we have a good base on the subject matter, uh, we're going to dive into the meat of the webinar, um, five ways we can leverage CRM data to increase engagement and drive revenue. And to help shed light on the strategy and execution of these programs, we have the lovely Diana Primo of CNET joining us to share how she and her team do just that. So uh, let's dive in. So, Thanks, number Brian. One. Of course. You're very lovely, Diana. <laughs> always a fun working with you. Thanks. So cool. So um, let's start with number one here, uh, using CRM data to maximize site traffic and revenue. So, you know, actively listening to our subscribers via their explicit preference selections or their email or site behavior, um, you know, we learn what they gravitate towards, uh, what interests them, uh, what piques their curiosity, what they care about, and, you know, what they want to get out of the relationship with your brand. So leveraging this in email to serve up content and calls to action that resonate will drive your desired response, you know, whether it's a read more or a buy now, um, you know, whatever that happens to be to either drive that conversion or that click through, that site visit, you know, it's you know, obviously going to depend on your goals. Um, so for CNET, uh, we leveraged in email click behavior and site browse behavior to drive segmentation. And that's kind of what we're seeing in this example. So, uh, Diana, maybe you can dive deeper into what we're seeing here. Absolutely. So th thanks again, Brian. And I want to thank everybody who's on the call who's taken the time to be with us today. We really appreciate it. Um, so if you take a look at what you're, you're seeing on your screen, it's pretty simple. You see two screenshots, and it's, just a, it's a real easy task that we've performed. If you look at the email on the, on the left or your left, this is what we call our control, and it's really just an example of that batch and blast style of email where all, you, you know, we've all sent, you know, we create something, everybody gets the same email. Well, the sun on the right is actually a combination of uh, 
the same control content, but it also includes content from uh, games and gear. So the games and gear is, is one of our personas, or it's one of the behavior, you know, the types of behaviors that we have. So this is just comparing using control, batch and blast, versus having um, actually uh, relevant data. And when we talk about the behaviors, what we look at at CNET, we look at things like monitor data from the site, so where people have been clicking on the site. We look at their profile data. We look at their click data and data from other emails. And, you know, this is really should not be a surprise to anyone by providing relevant content and using that CRM data, we have 131% increase in clicks. And then if you think about it on the bigger picture, if you have higher engagement, you get more page views. So if you're in retail, that can mean more um, sales. If you work in media like I do, um, there's more revenue there, more, more exposure to the ads. And then we've got these great ad units on the page. So if we send out more emails, higher engagement, higher open rates, higher click rates, we're going to receive more revenue from the ads as well. It's, a, it's actually it's a win all around when you think about it. So, Brian, what are some of the other ways that people can drive more traffic and revenue? Yeah, great question. So, you know, like you said on the last page, that, that personalization within your email uh, is key. And, you know, if you're joining this webinar, I'm pretty sure you, you know, that's not the first time you've heard that. Um, what is cool, though, here on this particular slide is a little twist on that personalization. You know, uh, typically, you know, we marketers are responsible for providing the most relevant content about our own brand in our emails. Uh, but when we are further monetizing our email programs with ad placements, we can deliver an experience similar to what we're seeing uh, here on this slide. Uh, here, subscribers are receiving similar CNET messaging, uh, but have tailored ads based on their interests and behavior, uh, brought to you by Live in 10 here. And while it may not be personalized content about the host brand, the implications of this um, ad personalization on the publisher, if you will, is not only better ad click metrics and more revenue, but you know that ad relevance you know can also be taken as a positive reflection on the you know on the brand at large. So you know just here we have uh, on the left hand side, you know it looks like a, a female mother receiving a Zulily ad, while you know the um, the male on the right, we got Jack and Jill here, is getting a, a you know something around go to meetings. Um, and um, you know. Diving into number two here, and I think this, you know, really is the precursor to driving that site traffic and revenue op optimization in number one, and that is uh, delivering personalized content. In over the last few years, a lot has changed in the general attitude and acceptance of data's role in personalization, uh, not only on the consumer side, but also on the uh, marketer side as well. And, uh, you know, where personalization was once, you know, a nice to have or maybe um, the mark of a brand that was at the forefront of you know, their, their marketing game. Um, now it's like a must-have, and our customers are demanding it. And in our most uh, recent consumer reviews of email marketing, almost 75% of the 1,800 respondents surveyed stated that they expected personalization based on online purchases and self-reported interest in their profile. So that's, that's huge. And 38% of those even um, expect us to personalize emails based on offline purchases. So, um, you know, as a marketer, we're now compelled to leverage the relevant, explicit, and implicit data available to us to bring personalized content to these subscribers when and where they are most likely to engage uh, and or convert. Uh, to do this, uh, a well-thought-out segmentation and content strategy are required. And this means starting with your most impactful buckets of subscribers and um, developing the appropriate content that resonates with the various segments. You know, and you know, a lot of times you, you hear that and it's a little daunting, but if you start small, maybe with some manual tests and don't try to boil the ocean, uh, you'll soon re realize that it's totally doable. You know, a, a quick easy way for retailers to start is, um, you know, maybe break out purchasers versus non-purchasers and develop appropriate messaging to them uh, to nurture subsequent purchases or, or foster a first, you know, respectively there. 
And uh, for content publishers and brands that don't use revenue as their conversion metric, you could try some, some, um, you know, something similar to what CNET did in this example. So, um, Diana, you know, speaking of, you know, I think that's something we bring up on our calls regularly is, you know, not boiling the ocean. Um, I don't know, maybe in this example you could tell us a little about uh, that and what we're seeing, um, in, in, what makes the background of this campaign. Yeah, absolutely. And so, as you know, I'm not a big fan of boiling the ocean. It's like starting out small and then figuring out how to scale it. And so we started out small by doing the tests and doing the work that you saw earlier. And so now we've actually um, uh, we, we've actually are in a place where we create, we call them personas, and we create these dynamic segments that based on the user's behaviors, it automatically dumps them into the, a bucket of, um, of which persona they fall into. So it makes it super easy for us when we get to a point where we are going to do a content send to figure out who it should go to because we have these personas already created and we know what's in them. So, um, and this is a perfect example. This is the send that we did last spring. It went, uh, it went the day after a big Apple announcement. It was sent to users who... Uh, uh, fit into our persona or have the related behaviors to Apple and to mobile. And by sending it to those folks, um, the engagement was wildly successful. Very, very high open, very, very high click-through rates. And just really demonstrating the, click, the power of, of using CRM data and making it relevant um, for those users. So, so Dave, delivering up personalized content, we're all talking about how important it is. When you think about doing it with ads and the customer's running a campaign, do you deliver up ads to their customers, or do you, how does that work? Well, it's, uh, how does that work? It's a, it's a great question. What we do is we put a very, very simple ad tag into the email template, uh, and then the email is sent by the publisher just like they send all of, the, all of their mail. It's, it's quite simple. You know, Blue Hornet's sending the mail. It's a mail, in this case, uh, the template is managed by, uh, by CNET and CBSI, and they send the mail. And then when the user opens, uh, they see uh, a piece of content or an ad. This is amazing for acquisition, actually. Um, in the past, people hadn't really considered email as an acquisition source. They always thought, oh, e email is a fantastic way to retain and communicate with customers, but it, is it actually uh, a good acquisition source? It is. And it's actually one of the best, if not the best way, to acquire people to add to your CRM database. The reason why advertising in email is so effective is that whenever you acquire someone from the email channel using an ad in email, you get someone who's a known email opener, a known clicker, and then someone who converts. This is really the kind of key customer that you want in your CRM database. You don't want a lot of top of the funnel leads. You want people who open, click, and convert. So uh, using uh, your data to suppress your existing customers and then running an ad for folks that are not on your CRM file is one way to use your CRM data. Uh, we do that. It, the product that we do that we have that, that um, uses this technique is called Live Audience. And a Live Audience allows you to load up your CRM database, just hashes of your email address, and then use that to either affirmative, uh, affirmatively target or to suppress so that you can either acquire or reach consumers. It's, um, it's something that we do uh, every day with, uh, with Blue Hornet and, and CNET, and it's quite effective. Now, let's go to uh, a little case study about one of our uh, partners. Uh, you might have seen in some of the other uh, slides here some examples of some ads in Diana's newsletters. Let's talk about one of them, the Daily Gromit. The Daily Gromit is a citizen commerce site. What they've, what they've done is they've put most of their budget into email acquisition, but not email acquisition by a search or by, by display ads or even by putting something like sign up on their own site. What they started doing was working with us several years ago to run campaigns in other people's emails for ads to, to sign up for the Daily Gromit. As a result, after working with Live Intent and running very, very many ads on uh, CNET and its, uh, its sister properties, 
they grew hundreds of percent a year and started moving all of their budget to email advertising because they found that the, the value of their CRM database was, was amplified by acquiring actual email users. So it's, um, it's a real-life case study. If you, uh, if you get email uh, from uh, CNET or from so many other of the 700 uh, publishing partners that Live Intent works with, uh, occasionally you'll see a uh, Daily Grommet ad, and I suggest you click on it. Uh, you'll get some really great stuff. And um, you're an email opener, so they'll love to have you on their file. Brian? Yeah, thanks, Dave. So, you know, once you acquire the subscriber, you know, you could really put your best foot forward during the onboarding phase by weaving in CRM data to trigger the right welcome emails with content that will bring and drive uh, greater engagement. So onboarding series are one of my favorite email programs to develop with our clients for a number of reasons. Uh, number one, you have the best chance of getting your message across as engagement on welcome message typically exceed uh, you know, two, to, two to three times your regular messages. Number two, uh, you can capitalize on this higher engagement by providing content that will help your subscribers get hooked on your brand. You know, give them um, the opportunities to check out your other relevant channels. Um, so you know, you're cross-selling there. You're providing opportunities uh, for your subscribers to share more about themselves, which will help you drive further personalization on your future messaging. You know, uh, what we call progressive profiling. And uh, third. You know, it's your chance to make a great first impression. You know, you're setting the stage for what they will expect down the road. And weaving in personalization can actually be a lot easier uh, than you think here, too. So, for example, triggering welcome messages based on the acquisition source is a quick and easy win that can show your subscribers you're listening to them right off the bat. In this example, uh, CNET triggers a welcome message specific to the CES uh, series subscription. And on the right, it's a trigger based on the language of their acquisition site. And uh, retailers can leverage the purchase or lack of purchase at acquisition to trigger a more personalized onboarding experience as well, uh, you know, that drives either that first purchase or repeat purchase. So, you know, based on that, uh, you know, once we got them in, let's talk about what happens when a subscriber falls off the engagement path despite all your best efforts and we try to re-engage them. Diana, why don't you tell us uh, what you guys did uh, here in this creative? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, um, we all want our customers to love us. And unfortunately, at some point in time, they may fall out of love with us for multiple reasons. And, you know, maybe we're not serving them up enough relevant content. So this is actually um, – uh, well, let me, start, let me start over. So, so we, we recently rolled out an automated win-back send. So when somebody does fall out in love with us, they, they're sent a series of three emails based on user behaviors. It's brand new. It's too soon to even talk about the results. But prior to that, we really wanted to, to get going. And so we, we created a hypothesis. And the hypothesis basically was a no-brainer. It said, we will win back more users if we provide them with relevant content based on their CRM data. And this is all about what we're talking about, right? So the first step we took was to validate the hypothesis. Um, in this test, we sent relevant content to inactive users comparing it to the shotgun approach. The test was completely manual. So again, going back to what Brian and was saying, you know, get started manually if you don't have the systems in place. And um, what we did was we sent relevant content to each of our personas, sending emails to inactive users. We didn't call it a win back send. We called it, um, internally, we called it a soft win back send because we didn't say to the users, you know, we miss you or come back. Um, it's really just about providing great content. Win back is something that uh, it's, it's a strategy, but it's not something that should be sort of one and done. You should have win back and ideas to re-engage your customers built into your email marketing plans throughout the year. So, and this is this email you're seeing here. It's part of the win back series. The persona here is wearable tech. So they received an email very specific to them. Again, relevant content. So in this series of um, manual win backs we did to all of our personas, 
we basically saw a 70% increase in engagement over the shotgun approach. So, you know, I talked about this earlier. You know, even if you don't have a system in place to support an automated series, it's really easy to get up and running, doing it manually. It might take a little bit more work, but it's super important to keep your list happy and to have good height to get have good hygiene. So, and you know, manuals one and done. The beauty of this, what we've got going in the future is it's automated. All we have to do is tweak it and optimize it, and it just continues to run. So we're super excited about it. So, Brian, I know you we're not your only customer. You work with a lot of customers, and there's a lot of great examples out there of other things people are using to win customers back. Yeah, absolutely. You know, you're, and you're right there, Diana. There's a lot of great email programs uh, specifically around WinBack that are out there. You know, and if you're on uh, Pinterest, you know, you search WinBack email examples, you know, you'll get just a, a super long page of scrolling through, you know, really cool creative things that brands have done. Um, and uh, here we have a, a great WinBack series example by Pet360. You know, in addition to employing their fun, uh, playful brand voice, you know, they've done a great job weaving personalization into the messages as well. In, um, in the creative on the left, we're seeing the first message as it would look to a subscriber who is a proud pet parent to a dog. Um, you know, and that's, again, you know, the imagery of the dog in all three sections there. Um, you know, if you were a cat owner, you would see cat, and then obviously if you didn't have um, th those um, preferences specified, you'd get a default, um, or if you had both, you'd get a mix. So they did a, a really nice job there weaving in some simple imagery. Um, and then on the message on the right, uh, you know, the subsequent creative is, again, we're seeing that more default content for, you know, people who have, haven't specified that they have pets or if they have multiple pets. And, um, you know, I, you were saying that subscribers fall sometimes fall out of love with us, and this could be a good example for, or a good opportunity for them to fall back in love with us. Um, you know, typically what we're seeing and uh, what our respondents said in our most recent consumer reviews is that, you know, 54% of them would uh, pull back from opting out, actually, if they could get more personalized content. So, you know, even if, if you haven't started yet, you know, it's never too late. So, um, now, were Pet360 to take their re-engagement initiative to the next level, uh, they could not only try and reach subscribers in their email list, but also leverage uh, the subscribers um, in emails from other publishers. So, you know, Dave, maybe you can explain how that works and, and what that would look like. So, winning back people by sending them uh, a, a different cadence of mail or, or testing subject lines we're trying to uh, introduce personalization. Those are all fantastic strategies, and, and everyone should continue to use them. However, sometimes things don't work in your own first-party mail. You say, well, how do I re-engage, or how do I cross-sell, or how do I engage more with my customer base using CRM data? Well, certainly you can use your CRM data and your segmenting strategy to win back your customers. And you can use that, again, in your own first-party mail. But uh, Live Intent specializes in helping you use that CRM data to win back people by reaching them when they're reading other people's newsletters. So because we have uh, tagged, I don't know, about five or 6,000 different newsletters from so many publishers, we're able to reach your audience, publisher, brand, whoever you are, when they are reading someone else's newsletter. We can put your, hey, uh, come on back, or your friends and family offer in someone else's newsletter. Because, you know, seriously, you can't time when someone's going to be checking their inbox. They may also, uh, you know, be avoiding your newsletter because they know they'll be tempted to buy. So why don't you do what – Everyone's been doing in media forever and advertise where the audience is. And the audience isn't always reading your, your, your catalog. Sometimes they're reading the newspaper or a magazine. So what you can use your CRM data to do is to load up segments into Live Intent 
and then target your users when they're reading other people's newsletters, such as CNET. It's very effective, and it allows you uh, to have a very, very light touch without having to increase send frequency. Uh, we refer to this, again, as CRM retargeting, and re-engaging re inactive subscribers is just one use of it. It's also a great way to do a best customer reach out and just uh, you know, tap your best customer on the shoulder. And I think let's go back to you and talk about uh, Blue Hornet, or are we going to talk about us and Blue Hornet? I think I'll talk about Blue Hornet. So Live Intent and Blue Hornet are partners. We give Blue Hornet the ability to, to leverage these techniques and these technologies, the ability to help you engage your subscribers outside of your own newsletters. Or if you're a brand on, on the call, if you want to acquire more customers for your CRM file, you can uh, give Brian a call and say, hey, Brian, I'd love to run an email advertising campaign. Can we work with you? And Brian can uh, put us together, Live Intent, Blue Hornet, and you, uh, their client, and we can do a campaign together. That's because Blue Hornet is live certified and a, and a great partner of ours, and uh, we look forward to, to working with you. Cool. Thanks, Dave. Well, um, that pretty much brings us into our learnings here. So kind of a recap of uh, the things that we talked about uh, regarding the five ways to monetize um, your email programs and drive revenue via CRM. So number one here, let's talk about um, CRM data and what it is and what it can tell you about your subscribers. So, you know, we're obviously dealing with individuals, you know, human beings, right? So these are people who are engaging with your brand in a variety of different ways. So your CRM data should ideally contain the engagement data across your channels so that you could drive personalized content, nurture, and um, extend the, the customer relationship, driving revenue and conversions you know, throughout that process. And number two here, the, the key um, is email address. Um, you know, Dave talked about how this is the unique key that ties it all together. Um, you know, Dave, you did a really great job uh, kind of breaking it all down. Anything to add on this particular learning? Um, well, CRM data can tell you so much about your users, um, and the reason why it's the most important thing is because it ties to so much data that you collect about your users, and specifically third-party databases. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, I, I'm going to group three and five here together. You know, three, how to leverage CRM data and improve everything uh, from acquisition segmentation and the benefits of having an onboarding program uh, with that uh, CRM data we woven in. Um, so, you know, we, we saw how CRM data essentially optimizes our segmentation and content strategy uh, from soup to nuts here, right? We saw how personalization plays an important role from the point we acquire subscribers to the point we are trying to re-engage and win them back. So specifically on acquiring, we learned about not doubling our efforts and paying for that same subscriber, you know, in a way more than once. Uh, right, Dave? And I guess that's what number four is essentially speaking to here. Right. Uh, number four talks about, you know, uh, not showing things to subscribers because, you know, sometimes you want to encourage people to come back and do something and you want to give them a different message. Absolutely. And uh, number six for our learnings here, um, how the largest tech sites use CRM to improve email engagement, re-engagement, and drive real revenue. Um, you know, we were able to see all these recommendations and practice through CNET's great examples here. And, and again, Diana, uh, I want to thank you for sharing uh, how you and your team were able to execute on injecting personalization to a number of these programs. So. Um, that essentially wraps us up. Diana and Dave, any last thoughts on your end before we move into Q&A? Yeah, you know, I, I would just add about the win back, or excuse me, not the win back, but the, um, the, the onboarding and the, the welcome kind of series and nurturing series. That is, so, that is so important. I mean, all of us have subscribed to emails, and the minute we subscribe to them, we get bombarded with all this stuff. And it's mm -hmm. kind of like, oh, my gosh, what am I supposed to do? So if you take the time to onboard your users and, and maybe at the same time not send them anything else, just hold them out until they get through that series, 
you get you have the opportunity to put your best foot forward and really show them as a brand what you're all about. And we know based on how strong our engagement is with that series that the users have made an effort to engage with your brand and they interact with you early, early on. So they're really demonstrating the value they feel about interacting with your brand. So it's really an important, we've learned it's just a really important first step. Absolutely. Like I said, it's one of my favorite programs to develop. A lot of fun. So cool. I guess moving now into our Q&A. Um, can we get any questions here? Absolutely we have. So um, first question here. Back to um, segmentation. And this probably is for, um, well, it could be for any one of you. With increased segmentation, users can now fall into multiple segments. If they are in multiple segments, they are most likely some of your better customers, mm -hmm. right? Um, does this team recommend general frequency caps? And Diana, why don't we start with you? Do you put frequency caps in place? Okay, so so there's there's a couple of pieces to that. Um, and our great subscribers do fall into multiple segments, and so we try to we try to think about that. And it's also something that we're working on right now is. We want to make sure because we want to make sure that they're always because they're in one segment. We don't want them to not get content about the other segment. So we're working on a strategy to make sure that we're kind of rotating the segments because we um, so that people get relevant content in all their segments. And you know the frequency cap is, a, is like that's a question I get asked all the time. And I. Um, worked with somebody really great at one time. She actually used to work at Blue Hornet. Her name was Kara. And um, I asked her that very question when I first met her. And she, her answer was really clear, and I've lived by this, um, from this from that day on. It's like, how much is too much? Just, you know, holiday. What happens during holiday for a lot of people? Not just retailers, for us. I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, you can send so many emails. And her answer was really clear. As long as the content is relevant, and as long as the users are engaging, there is not such a thing as too much. And so we really, really watch our numbers, and we dial it back when we start to see engagement uh, dropping. And then we kind of ramp it back up as it makes sense. We watch our numbers every single day. But as long as you're delivering relevant content, if you're just like emailing, 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 people are going to, you're going to lose them. Batch and blast, yeah. it just doesn't work. Yeah, so I, I totally agree, Diana. You, you have to look at your cadence. One of the reasons why everyone on the call should be looking at CRM retargeting is because it enables you to increase uh, your frequency of customer touch without bombarding them with too much email. There's a, there's a way, there's a, the, the first party email um, is a fantastic tool. It's one of the most effective marketing tools ever. But um, the reason why people continue to advertise, brands continue to advertise in uh, newspapers and on television, on radio and in magazines, is because they need to catch people when they're paying attention to other media. And people, um, as long as it's non-interruptive, people will catch your brand message outside of your first party media. So you can supplement that higher frequency mailing campaign with a lighter CRM retargeting campaign that's running in other people's email. So, um, and by mixing those two things up, you can uh, have higher frequencies of touch um, without having to max out all on uh, sending your own email. Absolutely. And, you know, I was just going to add probably from a, a tactical uh, perspective, you know, I think maybe at the root of that question is, you know, let's say you have you know, 12 different segments, and again, your most engaged subscribers are going to uh, end up in maybe all 12 of them, right? Um, if you were setting up 12 separate messages, you're going to have to, you know, work in that logic to, you know, create a hierarchy and suppress certain people. But, you know, obviously the, the most efficient way to do that and the most automated way to do that would be to have, you know, a single message. Uh, with, you know, variable content based on um, the user's uh, preferences or segmentation. And then within there, you could either opt to show all of the content that is you know, that they're eligible for, or maybe the top three or just the top one, whatever you feel is 
um, you know, the most important or is going to garner the, the best click. You know, so that I think maybe from a tactical standpoint, uh, to answer it from that perspective, um, may be the way to address the frequency rather than run the risk of sending 12 different messages and having that, uh, that subscriber eligible for them all. You know, you narrow it down to one, and most ESPs will obviously not resend the same message to the same subscriber uh, 12 times if it's a single send. Great. Thank you all. Um, here's another one. Uh, this is for you, Diana. What system do you use to create your audience segments? <laughs> well, Kim, <Karen. laughs> we use Blue Hornet. And so we, we use Blue Hornet and uh, working with our audience team, which is Brian, um, it, it, it's super easy. And now that they're created, I mentioned it before, they're dynamic. And so once we've taken the time to create those segments, um, whenever anybody has a behavior related to that segment, they're automatically dumped into it. New users are added to it. It's, um, it's awesome. Thanks, Diana. Mm -hmm. um, here's another one. Um, when I'm considering starting out with advertising and email, should I focus in on one particular campaign or one particular um, type of communication mechanism versus another? You know, what's going to be the, the best way to kind of get started with advertising? So typically, it sounds like it's for me, so uh, I'll take it. The most important thing uh, in email advertising, um, well, the several most important things are um, a clear call to action. So make sure that when someone sees the the uh, the ad, which is going to look just like a like a display ad, make sure there's a clear call to action. Uh, make sure that you've got a couple of different creatives, and then the probably the most important for success is if you actually get somebody to click. Uh, and you do, quite a few, make sure there's some, some good place to land that fits what someone clicked on. Uh, you need to make sure that if they click on an ad that says, register to do this, that you make it very, very simple once they land on that page to register. And you also want to think about simplifying it because 50% of the people that you're going to see in email are on mobile devices. And they may be waiting for their friends who are late, and so they're checking their email, on their phone, at Starbucks, make sure you make everything very easy and plain and easy for them to do. So it's not just the, not just the ad, um, it's also where they land when they click. Here's a great related question for you, Diana. So um, of the ads that CNET delivers, um, which have you considered you know, the most successful and why do you think they were the most successful? Good question. So I mean, we've done a bunch of different things, and just in sort of like in general, things are very successful because because the way our ads are served up, because they are based on CRM data, we're, we're the, the ads that we deliver are relevant to our users. So we just see success there across the board. But one of the things that um, has been very successful um, is is you know is targeting across the network. Maybe um, you know we you know we have a Spanish-speaking site that is targeted to Spanish-speaking customers in the United States, and so serving those ads up across the live intent network and focusing on them is very very successful. Great, thank you. Um, and here is our final question. Um, we talked about kind of not boiling the ocean um, several times. And so if you look at um, what you want to deliver first, as well as greatest ROI, um, are there suggestions from this team on, um, you know, kind of biggest bang for your buck right out of the gate? Um, and I'm going to look at Brian for okay. this. That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think we talked about onboarding and re-engagement, and of those two, you know, it, it's sometimes tricky, you know, uh, with our brand. Uh, the brands that we work with, sometimes they're, we're dealing with a really small subset or we're dealing with an old list where the, the new subscribers um, seem like a smaller audience than that huge mass of inactive subscribers. Maybe it's just, you know, they've had their program for a number of years and it's just, you know, reached a critical mass on that inactive side. So, you know, looking at a, a 
target perspective, it looks like there's a bigger target on the win-back side, but you do need to realize that those people have such a low propensity to engage versus that smaller group that does have a really high propensity. So that being said, you know, just regardless of the size, I would focus on, you know, people coming into the program and um, starting there and then moving whatever you're setting in those expectations forward. And hopefully, you know, you're, you're closing the sieve in a sense and people aren't getting to that inactive um, phase as quickly. Maybe you're holding on and retaining them a little bit longer. So, um, you know, like I said, that onboarding program, um, people are uber engaged at this point in time. They've actively sought out, put their email address in a field, and they've requested that you send them some information. So, you know, whatever that value prop that was provided during that acquisition, you know, deliver on it, uh, you know, hype it up and, you know, deliver on it. So from there, I would focus on onboarding and, you know, really setting uh, the stage for what's to come and delivering. Great. Thanks. Any perspectives, uh, Diana or Dave? Yeah, absolutely. So I think that um, one of the things that happens is when people get on, you know, get started or move to a new system or whatever, they, they focus on the new shiny thing where you've got a bunch of low-hanging fruit in front of you. And so I think, like to Brian's point, the, the onboarding series is very important. You're getting new – those new customers are already coming to you do it, do it right. Make sure that, you know, optimize your programs, get to nuts. Make sure that, you know, if they're clicking back to the site, like Dave said, that, 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 that they're getting the right experience. A lot of times you get email and you click back to the site and it looks like you're, it's a different company. And so make sure that you're, you're taking the experience that your current users have, you're optimizing it. And um, I also would add, I think the Windex, or Windex series is important because it's going to help your deliverability and it's going to make sure that you get more of your active users in their inbox, your emails in their inbox. So it's kind of a holistic thing, but before you reach out and try to do new things, optimize what you have so that as you get more new customers, they're, you're putting your best foot forward and you're going to retain them longer. And then, and then go out and start, you know, re looking for new customers and, you know, if, you have a, if they have a crappy experience, if you get a new customer and they got a crappy experience when they come to your site, we failed, right? So make sure the site mm -hmm. and the email experience is great, and then go get new customers. Yeah, and I've got, I've got one more thing to, to say about uh, whether it's onboarding or reactivation. When, when, you, when you get somebody who uh, clicks through, no matter which way they got to you, they're showing a tremendous amount in, of intent. New to file in CRM terms, is uh, potentially one of your best uh, new friends, your best customer. So it's very, very important that you do it right from the very start. Don't sit on that name very long. When you, when you get somebody, you need to put a message in front of them because they're probably right in front of their machine. If you wait a day, the decay on the value of the record that you just created is, is, is going to be very, very high. You need, to, you need to reach people when they're interested, in communicating with you, and that's right when you uh, when you collect that that first that first interaction. Great, thank you all very much, and thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, on behalf of Blue Hornet, Live Intent, and CNET, we want to thank you for joining us, and I uh, hope you found this session informative and gathered some helpful takeaways that you can use to maximize your email marketing program and your advertising. So have a great rest of the day. Thanks much.